So today's DFN Lounge guest is Tara Cookson, an assistant professor of gender development and global public policy at the University of British Columbia and the co-founder and director of research at Ladysmith. Ladysmith is a feminist research consultancy that works with international organizations to collect, analyze, and take action on gender data. Through her work, Tara has collaborated with institutions such as UN Women, UNICEF, the International Labour Organization, and many others. Today's discussion will be about gender data projects with a focus on Lady Smith's gender data kit and their current project, Cosas de Mujeres, which we will dive into shortly. Tara, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, and to start us off, Tara, could you just tell us a bit more about Lady Smith and what it means to take a feminist perspective on gender data projects? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for us taking a, um, us at Lady Smith, um, the team where we've really operationalized a lot of this work, but also me as a scholar, um, it really means taking a very um, holistic perspective and um, making sure that there is space for um, the actual uh, uh, perspectives and analysis and experiences um, of people as gendered subjects informing the data itself. Um, so everything in research from, you know, what questions are asked and the, the approach of the research um, to the kind of policy consulting work, like who sits at the table, uh, you know, whose voices get to inform what's considered data, what's considered evidence or knowledge that then goes in to inform our policies and programs. Wonderful. Yeah, I think those are such important aspects that can be incorporated into a wide variety of projects and initiatives. And so as we will be talking about gender data projects, which are often closely linked with filling what we call the gender data gap, I think it would be helpful to provide some context around these data gaps. So in your experience, what are data gaps and what are the root causes of these gaps? Yeah, so um... Back about sort of six -ish years ago, when the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals were in the process of getting um, formulated, um, you had stakeholders from all over the world, member states, civil society organizations, multilateral institutions, all sitting together and thinking about um, what the next set of global development goals should be following the Millennium Development Goals. And there was a side conversation going on about evidence, about data and evidence. And around this time, um, Hillary Clinton came out and made this sort of announcement and, and call to action around um, collecting data on the lives of women and girls and using that to inform policy. And there was this sort of like thesis put out there, um, this hypothesis put out there that, um, or argument that in order to achieve gender equality, we actually needed more and better data, uh, specifically on the lives of women and girls. That's what the, the context was at the time, although that's broadened out now. Um, and that lacking that data, lacking those um, those kind of evidence-based pieces of, of information, our policies and our programs um, were less likely to actually um, benefit all people in an inclusive and equal way. And so these were constructed as gender data gaps, data gaps that we needed to fill. And most of the time, um, certainly in the kind of earlier days after this, around six-ish years ago, gender data was associated with sex disaggregated data. So data that's um, typically collected uh, by um, national statistical offices. Um, it can be civil registry data, so births, deaths, marriages, uh, things like this. Um, and that's kind of like very important, very foundational baseline policy data. 
Since that time, though, there has been new players that have showed up in this kind of gender data space. So you've got, you know, tech companies and um, computer scientists playing with like digitally generated data. And so they're thinking about what kinds of data gaps or questions in our understanding about gendered lives and, and inequalities, inequalities, can we understand with digitally generated data? So then we're, you know, moving beyond sex disaggregated statistics. And something that um, I've uh, personally worked a lot on with um, my uh, dear colleague and co-author Lorena Fuentes, also the co-founder of Ladysmith, is ensuring that um, gender data also includes a qualitative picture of people's gendered lives. So that there's actually voices and uh, perspective and analysis um, coming from the people who are the beneficiaries of particular policies, for example. So these gender data gaps that I think at the very beginning of what's often referred to as the gender data revolution, um, was really focused on at that point sex disaggregated data and it's moved beyond this now um, to think about other forms of data um, as well and the, and the gaps around those. Thank you. Yeah, that was a wonderful description of kind of that evolution that's happened with gender data and how now we need to do more than and just look at the numbers but really bring those numbers to light with mm -hmm. women's and girls experiences as well as others. Mm -hmm. So now that we have a stronger understanding of Lady Smith's work and why data gaps exist, we're going to dive into the meat of today's topic, which is Lady Smith's current project, Cosas de Mujeres, which at a high level is a WhatsApp supported platform that connects women with services that respond to and prevent gender based violence, whilst also generating actionable data surrounding women's experiences with gender based violence also known as GBV. So could you share some more details on this project and what led to its initiation for Lady Smith? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we had been Lady Smith as an organization kind of working in this space for a few years and um, thinking through these sort of um, tensions and the possibilities in what it means to close gender data gaps and um, the impact that gender data gaps have on policy making and program design. And so we knew we wanted to try doing some kind of um, some kind of project or initiative that took all of these like theories and concepts that we had, Lorraine and I had had swimming around in our heads around what kind of data matters in this context. Um, how can you collect um, qualitative data quickly in a way that's still sort of true to feminist principles of research? Because of course, you know, you can spend a year doing an ethnography uh, at the university, but you can't spend a year doing an ethnography, um, you know, for uh, a UN institution or a government. They move much, much more quickly than that. And we had a, a colleague, Julia Zelver, who was uh, doing research for a long time on the um, armed conflict in Colombia, and she was doing work at the border of Colombia and Venezuela, where um, over the past five or so years, there's been um, what is now one of the largest humanitarian migrations in contemporary history out of Venezuela and, and through the region. And, and Colombia being a neighboring country, there's a lot of uh, movement there. And Julia had been talking to uh, folks on the border um, who were saying, who were reporting a lot of incidences of sexual and gender-based violence um, against women who were crossing from Venezuela into Colombia, passing through Colombia or staying in Colombia, et cetera. And there was also this discussion as well around sort of like lack of services to prevent and respond to sexual and gender-based violence in this context. But as Julia was sort of chatting with um, chatting with the sort of service providers of the international community who were there, 
um, the humanitarian response community, um, the national uh, uh, responders as well. There was this kind of um, response that, you know, yes, we all know it's happening sort of anecdotally, but there's no data on it. There's no data to show that it's happening so that we can then go and generate the resources and, you know, beef up the services um, for women in this context. And so we said, okay, if a lack of gender data is the problem, why don't we try to generate that data quickly and in a way that's in line with some key feminist principles of, of research and data collection and see what we can do, see if that kind of like moves a lever or pushes anything. Um, so we, um, we went and we did some scoping research and we, um, we spoke with women on, at the border, we spoke with service providers, you know, what kind of data do you need? Um, you know, what level of disaggregation? Um, is it sex? Is it gender? Is it age? Um, is it nationality? Uh, all of these sorts of different pieces. Um, you know, we talked about things like that. And in our conversations with women, we talked about, okay, what resources do you have at your disposal? Like, how could we collect this data in a way that isn't burdensome, that isn't cumbersome, that isn't trying to like involve a whole bunch of women in the middle of a crisis, you know, in a research project, and that actually benefits them at the same time, like gives them something that they need as well. And so out of this, Cosas de Mujeres was born. Um, we identified that a lot of women had access to on their phones um, or on a friend's phone or a family member's phone, WhatsApp, and they were using it to coordinate transport, to figure out how to get their kids enrolled in school, you know, where, where to get a, a UNICEF package of, you know, of cash transfers and menstrual hygiene supplies. And so we built this platform where a woman can message into Cosas de Mujeres and uh, ask for information um, about services that prevent and respond to gender-based violence. And we conceive of that really broadly. So um, that's not just like a woman's shelter, although it also includes that. Um, we take a broad conceptualization that also includes social protection services. So like cash transfers, access to health care, access to sexual and reproductive health care, um, soup kitchens, all this sort of thing. And we, we map that, we ground truth that with um, that service offering with local women's organizations who can help us understand like, okay, that service is inclusive. So um, if it's a migrant woman, they're not woman, they're not going to discriminate against her. Or if it's a trans woman, they're not going to discriminate against her. And we really figure and map that out. And through these conversations, we develop a data picture of what it is that women need in this particular situation. What kind of information are they looking for? And through that, what kind of services do they need to be provided? Um, and so then we're feeding that kind of um, collated picture up to the service providers where we're trying to push then for, we need a, a shelter in this area. Or actually women are asking for cash transfers or, or that sort of thing. So that's, that's Cosas de Mujeres. It's been operating now for two years and is currently in three cities in Colombia um, with funding from uh, the Canadian government and the, uh, the US government and UN women. Amazing. Yeah, I think it's such a unique project in that it's meeting the needs of those women in such volatile, volatile areas, while also building up that bank of gender data that is so needed in that space. Yeah. And as you mentioned, it's expanded from one city to now being in three cities. And mm -hmm. in reading some of your earlier briefs on the project, it was mentioned that some of the next steps were to socialize the Cosas de Mujeres WhatsApp number to gain greater traction. So I was wondering, as GBV can be such a sensitive topic, what steps did you take in order to gain more widespread adoption and allow it to grow and scale to three cities? Yeah, um, that's such a good question. And it's really tied into the piece about grounding it in like local women's movements 
and um, grassroots service provider groups. Um, so we, from the outset, worked with um, a local academic um, in the social work uh, school in Kukuta, and she connected us with some of her social work students. So students who are finishing like their master's work, um, who've been out in the community, who have experience working in the area of gender-based violence or sexual and gender-based violence, and they've become our uh, community workers, our, um, um, our gestoras, um, you would say. So they, uh, in conjunction with um, uh, local CSOs or um, like civil society organizations, um, they go out into the community and do a whole bunch of different activities depending on where it's at. So they might um, have a huge like mural that gets painted with the Cosas de Mujeres um, colors and the number. And it's an opportunity for women to kind of come together and, and engage in this artistic project that at a high level socializes it in a very visible way. Um, but we also um, have like little cards that looks kind of like a little business card um, that sort of says, you know, do you need information, but doesn't say anything about sexual and gender-based violence. Otherwise, in case that card was discovered, say by an abusive partner or family member or whatever. And we drop those off in bars and nightclubs and hair salons and at soup kitchens, um, as well as just to, you know, to women that we see who are crossing the border. And it's those social workers themselves who are out in the community doing that, that have the experience being in those communities, having those conversations. Um, and that's, uh, we, we sort of collect data on ourselves as well, and that's proved to be a really important component of the program. Like, we can actually see that once one of our um, community workers has gone out into the community, you see sort of like an uptick in messages um, after a day that, that she's gone out, an uptick in messages to the platform. Um, so we know that women are connecting in that way. Amazing. Yeah, I think taking that community based approach is definitely what's separated it from other projects and made it feel like you're not imposing, but instead really trying to integrate with that community and bring these services to as many people. And that piece about kind of self reflection of you guys are tracking how your um, community workers are doing and iterating as you go is also a really important aspect of that. Yeah. And so another question I had were, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced in executing this project and what learnings came from those? Yeah, um, so, I mean, there's been a few, there's always, there's always a bunch in any project like this, if anyone tells you it went seamlessly, it's probably not the truth. Um, one of the things where we've had, maybe two things where we've had some interesting learning. One is around, um, the actual data that we're collecting and the other is around automation. So with the data that we're collecting, we've had to consider very carefully something called data minimization. So the idea that you actually collect the least amount of data necessary to achieve your, your goal. So it's not that you try to get every bit of information about every woman uh, who messages into the platform and every little piece of information about her experience for a number of reasons. Because it's not aligned with sort of like data safety and, and the you know ever developing kind of uh, norms around data rights. Um, you don't wanna collect data that could eventually, you know, that, I don't know, could eventually be traced back to a woman. You don't want to place undue burden by trying to get more and more and more data out of someone. So we've had to have conversations with our data users, the women's groups and the service providers that use the data around, okay, do we need to disaggregate by like seven different factors? Do we need age, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, sex, 
um, you know, migration status, neighborhood, et cetera, what's like the, the least kind of, what's the shortest list of those factors where the data is still useful? Um, so that's an ongoing piece too. That's something we're constantly going back to and iterating on. Okay, what, you know, what is the least kind of burden and risk in the kind of data we're collecting? And we think that's really important for all organizations to do. We give away our data all the time. Um, and the second piece around automation, there's a lot of craze around like chatbots, for example, or automating um, systems like Cosas de Mujeres. How can you make it more efficient, scale it bigger? And so we have these uh, conversations around automation where we've had to think really carefully about how to push back on those those conversations like actually when a woman messages in um, it's a real person it's a real human it's a social worker on the other end of that phone who's providing her with information okay maybe you need this service or maybe this is what you're looking for um, so pushing back against the sort of impetus that comes from donors and that comes from within the tech community to automate a gender data project further and further and further so that it's like a robot that you're interacting with um, and something we always say is, you know, even, even for us, you know, behind the program, we hate calling into an airline and you get a robot or into your bank and you get a robot. So why would you ever want um, in a vulnerable situation to be interacting with a robot? Um, so those are two challenges that we've had and continue to kind of work through and, and try to improve our service um, in light of those tensions. It seems like a thoughtful approach in terms of the data that's being collected, but also how has been yeah. a learning curve and experience yeah. throughout this. Yeah. And so my last question to wrap this up before we go into a Q&A from the audience is, how do you plan to continue disseminating the results of the project to encourage action at the government as well as community level? Yeah, so... I mean, to date, we've been doing this through our gender data briefs. We've published these short policy briefs that you may have seen on the website. Um, and we accompany those within, within Columbia with um, presentations and webinars and one-on-one and -on -one chats with policymakers and service providers where we sort of say, okay, this is what we found. And we think that you know, in the city of Cartagena, this is one way that you could actually take action on this data. And we've done things, for example, like advocating for the reopening of a women's shelter that was closed during COVID. We've also had sensitization workshop with um, a local police force uh, so that when women go to report violence, that they're not sort of being told like, oh, we're in a pandemic and that's non-essential. Um, so, so working with partners on the ground. Something that's kind of like the next phase for us is um, a, pro, uh, a kind of program um, around handover. So we're actually looking to take Cosas de Mujeres and transition it to local ownership under in the humanitarian sector, what's called like a localization agenda. So the idea being that working with the women's organizations that we've worked with, you know, all along and the donors that we've worked with all along, how can we actually transition the program so that it is run locally and embedded into the systems and the the institutions that need change. So it's almost like bringing the data piece closer to those institutions. And that's something that for 2022, that's a, a big goal for us. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so now I'd like to open the floor in these last five minutes to any questions from the audience, feel free to send them in the chat and I can read them out or even better. And if you prefer, you can raise your hand um, and I'll call on you to unmute yourself. And I see we have one hand raised already. Forgive me if I mispronounce your name, Tawhida. Yes, hello, my name is Tawhida Wahabzada. Um, I'm calling in from Toronto and I wanted to ask um, a question more about collaborations with, um, I guess like the broader national government. 
Yeah. And I was wondering if there's any future intentions to collaborate with national government agencies of Colombia. From my understanding, I do know that um, Dane, the National Statistical Office, has pretty good um, capacity when it comes to collecting data on migrants. So like for their ongoing survey instruments, like um, their living conditions survey and um, forget another survey, they do collect information on migration status of household members. And I was wondering, is, are there any intentions to collaborate with Dane so national governments can use alternative sources of data? Yeah, totally. Um, nice to meet you, Tahida. Um, and greetings in Toronto. I love Toronto. Um, we do collaborate with Dane, actually. This summer, we produced a jointly authored uh, data brief um, where Dane used the migrant data that you're talking about, the um, quantitative data, and we used our qualitative data generated through Cosas de Mujeres, and we um, developed that brief together um, to inform kind of national uh, decision-making processes. So you can find it on um, genderdatakit.org. I can put it in the, um, in the chat here. Um, yeah, and um, they've been awesome, uh, awesome to collaborate with. And that collaboration came out of uh, uh, myself and the, the gentleman, the head of Dan A, speaking at the United Nations together on a panel and having an awesome chat afterwards and saying like, hey, we should, we should mash up these, these two different data, um, see what we can find. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah. And Rosalie, did you want to go ahead? Yeah, um, I'm calling in from Vancouver and I, I work here as an economist. And one of the things that I often do when I'm working on a project is thinking about how time interacts with what our response variables are, which is hard to do sometimes. It kind of takes an extra level. And I was thinking back to some of my experiences, which include you know, working at the end of a hotline where women called in and also working in, um, in a police station in a rural area. So these are kind of disparate, but I draw it together. And one of the things that I thought is it can take a lot of time to help a victim of violence. Yeah. Um, it can take years for someone to feel ready to move from a position where they are a victim into a position where they are protected, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, like, how have you guys managed to fit that in? Because people want data, like, data is a snapshot. And it's really mm -hmm. hard to kind of get that time perspective yeah. in. So how are you guys going to follow up and think about that longer time? Yeah. Period? yeah. Thanks, Rosalie. Um, it's interesting because my my aunt is actually based in Vancouver and, and has volunteered for 22 years with the police department and victim services. So um, I've had a couple of these conversations with her too. So we have, and this is one of the learnings, I could have answered this earlier too. Um, we've also had to do a lot of hard thinking about what it is that we do, what our intervention does. Um, not to kind of like take on the whole kitchen sink and do a bunch of things poorly, but just one thing, hopefully well. And so we've really honed in on being a provider of information in two ways. So at a provider of information, um, at the moment that a woman is asking for it, um, and a provider of information um, in a relatively quick, like, you know, if, if someone wrote to us today and said, you know, can you give us some data on XYZ component of, you know, migrant women's experiences in Cucuta, we could do that right now, but, you know, maybe we generate it monthly or something. Um, but it's because of our data minimization um, and the, the data privacy things, we don't follow up with women. So if a woman messages in today, she actually gets a reminder to delete the message at the end of our conversation with her. Hey, delete this message from your phone. 
so that then she can choose to like, okay, I'm going to, if, if I, she shares this phone or lives in, in a house with a violent uh, individual, she can then delete it there. So we don't have that like long-term with the individual wim, uh, women, but something that we're doing in this coming year is trying to track like, okay, these data briefs that we've produced in these conversations and trainings, to what extent have the data users, you know, the service providers, the, the police, whoever, the National Statistical Institute, to what extent have they used it over time? Has it changed things over time? But yeah, that that temporal aspect is tough, and and um, you know, on 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 kind of both of those directions. So yeah, it's also a thing, just like continuing to iterate on it. Yeah. Thank you so much for your questions and your responses, Tara. I'm just going to share my screen again here for a quick wrap up. So I just want to say thank you so much for being with us today, Tara, as our guest. If you enjoyed today's lounge, stay tuned in to DFN's LinkedIn page and other social media channels for our upcoming events. Notably, we have a DFN lounge at the end of the month with Nadia Ahijo from Equal Measures 2030 and Naomi Niamwea from Malala Fund. And we also have our monthly book club. Um, and this month we are reading The Costs of Connection.